Today we have an episode that is likely to be quick, but I think is going to be a lot of fun. What's up, guys? My name is Chris, and you are listening to the Whiskey Noobs Podcast. And today we're not just talking about what makes bourbon expensive. That's that's the subject of the episode. But we're living it. We're walking through it. I am doing a blind tasting in this episode, which I might start doing more often because I'm like, oh, I have the ability to do that. I can just have my wife pick a whiskey, and uh, I'll try it blind you know i'll try it without knowing what it is during the episode so that's what we're doing today and in the meantime i'm going to talk about what makes bourbon expensive so of course i'm going to talk about the different things going on with the market right now that can tend to drive up prices but i'm really going to zero in on the things that i look for in my blind tastings that i do on the the instagram the youtube channel and the tiktok channel because i've been doing these blind tastings I've, i forget how many i've done now i've done a handful of them now and i really feel like i've learned a lot about what it was that i was looking for in the beginning and so i want to share those things that i have kind of learned about what to me makes a whiskey more expensive or in this episode we're zeroing in on bourbon because bourbon is just continuing to get more expensive so like i said a lot of what i'm about to talk about applies to all whiskey but i'm specifically going to be talking about bourbon because we're seeing it the worst right now in the bourbon world prices keep increasing they need to stop it needs to level off a little bit i'm going to talk about those things that are really driving that uh People like to ask me when the bubble will pop. I just had this question in the last Q&A episode, and I don't know. I don't know if it's going to be a bubble. I don't know if it's going to pop. I don't know if it's just going to level off, and I don't know when that's going to happen. I do hope, I am hopeful that we're going to see it happen, but I don't know for sure if we will. I think it's slowing down a little bit, and I think we're starting to get more and more pushback against these just ever-rising prices of, of whiskey and of bourbon specifically. So I'm going to break all that down a little bit from the market standpoint and a lot from the whiskey tasting standpoint. That's really what I want to hone in on so people understand what to expect as you climb up in price. But of course, there are other things that influence it that I will cover as well. Before we get started, I just want to ask you to take a quick moment, click the link in the show notes, go check out the Patreon page and see if you are interested in joining. I would really appreciate you just considering it. There's never been a better time to join the Patreon page if you want to support the show because I am working on raising enough monthly income in order to be able to have regular editing of the podcast that will make it a higher quality show. It'll make it more fun to listen to and definitely more visually appealing. And it's also going to give me more time instead of editing the show to be able to come up with better episodes and do more in-depth, better research for the show. So that's the hope. If you want to support that dream, if you want to support that growth of the podcast, please just go check out the Patreon page. And if you can't do that, I totally understand. Thank you so much to all of the patrons. If you can't support financially, I totally understand. Please consider just taking a moment to give a five-star rating and or review on iTunes or on Spotify or wherever you're listening because those help a ton as well. Now, let's move on into what's making bourbon so expensive. I know that's what you guys came here for. I had to give the Patreon a quick plug. So I started this series on social media, which hopefully you have seen, where I I was calling it What's It Worth for a while. Essentially, I'm just having my wife grab any bottle while I have my eyes closed, and I'm doing a blind tasting of the bottle. And I want to do episode versions of that, so I am going to hopefully start sprinkling in more episodes like that, especially if you guys think this is fun. If you think it is, please leave feedback on this episode. You can do that through Spotify. You can like mention your thoughts on the episode or ask a question, or just let me know through the normal channels uh, your thoughts on it. But I'm going to do that in episode format with this episode. But more importantly, doing those videos has taught me a lot about what I look for in different bourbons and just whiskey in general that I think makes them taste more expensive. So I thought that series was going to do terribly and I want to start there. I thought I was going to be very bad at guessing how expensive a whiskey was because I thought there's not going to be a lot of objective things I can look for that are really going to help me to know how expensive this whiskey is. And of course, I probably won't be the greatest at finding those things. And I thought it would do badly in terms of my accuracy, but I thought it would do well in terms of virality. I thought 
it's going to be funny if I guess that something is cheap and it's actually very expensive. I thought it's going to probably go viral if I overestimate one way or the other. If I if something's really expensive and I say it's trash, that'll probably do well. If something is, you know, very inexpensive and I say, "Oh my gosh, this is a $100 whiskey." That's going to do well. And so in general, I was like, you know, I probably won't be great at it, but at least it's going to be good content and people are going to get my genuine opinions about these whiskeys without me knowing what they are. And I just can't emphasize this can't emphasize this enough. I'm not cheating on those because those are fun for me as well. And I'm, that's all I'm going to say about that. I'm not cheating during that series. I'm not looking. But the thing is, there are objective things in whiskeys that you can kind of look for to understand how where it lands in that price range. And a lot of this, I, I don't think it's you know this major committee that sits down and try. I mean, there are a lot of competitions that sit down and try these whiskeys. But, but that's after they're on the market. I don't think there's any higher institute of whiskey that's trying these and saying that is a $60 bourbon. It's more so it's kind of like natural filtering. And you know, the professionals in the business know how much something's worth. So it's going to get knocked down by your professional reviewers if it is not a nice whiskey and it's being sold as an expensive one. So it's kind of naturally filtered. And of course, if the company realizes they're able to make more money off of it, they're going to kind of raise up that price. So Because of that, you get these kind of objective things that I didn't really know and I didn't put to words until I started doing this series and I realized it. And I'm like, oh, these are all things that I'm kind of looking for as I'm doing these tastings. Ironically, it worked out and and I ended up doing pretty good. So if you haven't seen the series, I guessed uh, many of them within, I'd say, $5 of the actual price or at least the Ohio price. And to be clear, all of my knowledge of pricing is Ohio pricing, except for secondary stuff, which obviously usually is not worth the price. But most of my knowledge of pricing is Ohio pricing, which in my opinion is usually the fair price. Sometimes it's a good deal. Sometimes it's just the fair price of the whiskey. Ohio controls all the pricing of all of their liquor. And so we know we're getting somewhat of a fair price. Usually it's close to MSRP. So to get this thing started, let's start with this blind tasting. I'm going to walk through it a little bit, mention the things that I'm tasting, and then I'm going to get into each of the different characteristics that I look for specifically to try to understand how expensive the whiskey is. And maybe if I'm feeling brave, I'll throw out a price. By the way, those blind tastings are nerve wracking uh, because I'm like, I don't want to look stupid, but also looking stupid would do well for content. So they're scary. Anyhow, let's get a quick nose, quick taste of this whiskey, and then I'll start to talk about the things that I'm looking for as I'm tasting it. So right away on the nose, this is light. This is white sugary. There's a little bit of an oakiness to it. Definitely some spice. Mm, A little bit of maybe a cinnamon and almost a touch of like a menthol. I'm going to go ahead and take a taste and see how similar it is. I'm going to throw this out there. This might be Wild Turkey 101, but I could be wrong. I could very well be wrong but it might be. I'm going to continue tasting now. On the palate, similar idea. Maybe a touch of a citrus, a little bit of a vanilla, a little bit of an oakiness coming through. That's all I got for now. Um, And obviously you guys know what I'm tasting, but the idea is you're walking through what's going through my head because I don't know what I'm tasting. Now let's talk about the things that I'm looking for. And we just did one of them. So the first thing that I'm looking for is the gut reaction. So I mentioned this in the episode uh, with that one dude, Ryan, which I think was the last episode in in the order that they're airing um, when we did our barrel pick. And I'm looking at my gut reaction. That does have an impact on price as well because a lot of people are going to do their shopping based on gut reactions. They're going to buy a bottle. They're going to take it home. They're going to try it, and they're going to be like, I like it or I hate it, and that's the decision that they're going to make, or they're going to make that decision at a bar. That is like a lot of whiskey drinkers, <clears throat> So, and there's nothing wrong with that, but my point is that it plays an important role in how much something's going to end up costing. So I like to just get a quick reaction as Ryan and I talked about in that last episode. I never really put it to words until Ryan had talked about that. And I'm like, that's that's a really good point. That is kind of a lot of times I'll end up going with my gut reaction. I'll kind of walk through the tasting and I'll, I'll have all these thoughts that we're about to talk about. And then at the end of the day, I'll say, what did I think when I first drank it? And that's very helpful. So the gut reaction should not be underestimated because it does play a very big role in your overall experience. Think about it this way. 
When you meet somebody, your first impression of them sticks. Whether you want it to or not, a lot of times it sticks. It can be the same way for whiskey. If you have a great first impression and then you walk through and you're like, eh, it's starting to taste less and less, you don't really notice it so much. And I've noticed this with myself. If I'm impressed by it the first time, a lot of times I'll continue to be impressed by it. Now, obviously, when I'm doing different reviews and things, I have to purposefully try not to let that happen. But in terms of the general public and what people are going to pay for on the market, that is a very important role. So I'm going to look at my gut reaction. I'm going to take a quick nose, quick sip, probably two sips, because that first sip a lot of times, especially if your palate's not warmed up, it's just going to burn. I'll take a couple of quick sips and get a general gut reaction. I'm going to take one more sip of this and, and kind of just disclose my gut reaction. So obviously I mentioned that right off the bat this kind of reminded me of Wild Turkey 101. And that was my gut reaction. It, it just generally reminds me of it. I'm not sure if it's oaky enough to be it. I could be wrong, obviously. Um, but in my gut reaction, it's got some spice to it. It's got some burn. It's getting my nasal cavity a little bit. Um, but it's not feeling super duper high proof on my palate. So I'm thinking maybe there's a little bit of a harshness here. Like maybe this is not in the... 50 and above dollar range that's gut reaction and i have gone against it before but a lot of times i end up going back to it but gut reaction i'm gonna say this is under 50 dollars, and that's the kind of large paintbrush i try to paint with in the gut reaction now let's get a little bit more specific the next thing i like to look at is the amount of flavor am i having to hunt out the flavors and especially am i having to hunt it out behind the alcohol or is it coating my whole palate and I'm getting a lot of flavor? You could consider this the body of the whiskey. When, when I say body, a lot of times this is what I'm talking about. Is it full? Is it coating my whole palate? And so obviously more body, more flavor tends to be more expensive. And this can be a really hard thing to get. And a lot of times it's one of those things that I see have a huge impact on the price because it's hard to do. It is hard to have a lot of flavor and not just taste like grain alcohol. So that's the next thing that I kind of look at. I'm going to take another sip and I'm going to talk about how much flavor I'm getting from this one. On the nose, it's a lot of flavor. It's not hard to smell, which would make me want to move the price up a little bit. But I'm going to try it on the palate and we'll see. The palate is where the flavor is going away a little bit for me. It's still got some flavor, but I'm finding myself having to hunt it out a little bit more. And I forgot to mention, for this episode and for future blind tasting episodes, I'm probably going to do a section of whiskey. It's going to be like specific whiskeys. So for right now, I gave Maggie, like my wife Maggie, like I think a dozen bottles to choose from. So I know it's one of those dozen. Um, I think I'm going to utilize that in a specific way in future episodes, which is why I'm starting that format right now. So it's for a specific reason. Uh, but at the moment, it's just to start that format. So when I'm talking about these whiskeys, I, I should I want to be clear that I'm not just like, oh, I tried Wild Turkey 101 once and I knew it was that. That's not what's happening. And it might not be Wild Turkey 101. But that it is narrowed down. I am... Uh, getting a it's a little bit easier than it is when it's on tiktok on tiktok and instagram and youtube that's any bottle in the room genuinely she can walk behind me and pull it off shelves if she wants to okay i wanted to have that disclaimer because i realized i should have mentioned it earlier now i noticed on the nose i was getting a lot of flavor it wasn't hard to find and then on the palate, I had to do a lot of the Kentucky Chew. I had to move it around my mouth quite a bit in order to get more flavor from it. That leads me to believe that I am correct it's in that sub-$50 range. And if it's not, I'm going to be disappointed. But it, it couldn't be. It might not be. I don't know. Uh, I think it's in that sub-$50 range. I'm going to even say right now, based on these two things, I'm, I still got more to walk through, this is in the sub $35 range, maybe even sub 30. I also look at the color and I'm looking at the color the whole time that I'm doing this, but color can be a very good indicator. If not due to causation, due to correlation. What do I mean by that? I mean that many of your distillers know that people think darker whiskey, especially bourbon is better. And because of that, they will make their selections darker now you can't add coloring to bourbon uh, but you can purposefully not water it down as much you can purposefully try to get more interaction with the barrel these are all things that 
could be considered that we don't really think about. We think everything they're doing, they're doing for the flavor. Not necessarily the case. They're doing it for presentation as well, sometimes. So I do pay attention to the color, and this is lighter. That's another indicator to me that it might be less expensive. And I should be clear when I say correlation versus causation, that is because I do not think that darker means better. I do not think that looking like a more full-bodied bourbon means it's a full-bodied bourbon. That is not always the case. Uh, and sometimes lighter bourbons are delicious, or whiskeys are delicious. But in the case of this one, um, it's looking pretty light. So far, it's giving me a few indicators that this is a less expensive uh, whiskey. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep below $30. That's where I'm sticking with for right now. The next thing that I'll move to is the quality of flavor versus the harshness. I'm not talking about if I like the flavor. That's different from the quality. The quality of the flavor is not just how much, like I said, the body. It's also how those flavors come through. Is it tasting like grain alcohol with some flavoring? Or is it tasting like whiskey with a little bit of ethanol, a little bit of alcohol? That is kind of what I attribute to smoothness a lot of times when I talk about smoothness. I'm talking about how well the flavor comes through and not the alcohol coming through. So that's kind of the next quality that I'm looking for. And it's a very easy one to notice a correlation in. So I don't think it always has the biggest effect on price. I've had ones that don't have a great ratio, but they're expensive. And a lot of times that's because they have unique flavors. They are uh, a lot of flavor, but it's just also a lot of alcohol with it. So it's not necessarily always the best cost indicator, but it is a cost indicator, and it's one of the easier ones to notice. It's very easy to be like, I'm getting more burn and less flavor, or I'm getting a ton of flavor and not a lot of burn. That's why it's one of the reasons you hear so many newer people saying smooth, and some of the more experienced people are like, smooth gets overused. It does. It gets mistaken for sweet. It gets mistaken for mellow. It gets mistaken for watered down. But it's still a good word if you're using it properly. In the way that I use it, I should say using it transparently, because you might have a different definition than me. The way I'm using it is amount of flavor to amount of burn. The drinkability, how the mouthfeel interacts with that to make it approachable. And it's very easy to notice. And on this one, I don't even need to taste it to tell you that it has a harshness to it. It has a alcohol taste, and that's different from strength. So it's not just, oh, this is high proof. It tastes a little bit like alcohol. That's a hard one to weed out. Uh, and I'll admit, for, for a long time, I confused the two. Uh, the taste of alcohol versus the feeling of alcohol. But it has an alcohol taste that the flavor profile doesn't fully get through. And that's one of the reasons I have to spend a little bit more time looking for that flavor profile. It's another one of the reasons that I think this is a sub $30 bottle of whiskey. If I'm wrong, I'm going to feel terrible. And I could be. It happens. It, it, here's the other thing. If you're wrong, if you do these at home and you're wrong, it happens. And I used to be wrong a lot. I used to do, when I, before I had the podcast, I do Guess That Whiskey with my wife. And I just have her go get one off my shelf. This is back when I had like 10 bottles on my shelf, granted. Um, and then I'd try it. And I'd be wrong all the time. This, this type of thing takes a long time to get good at. And I could still very well be wrong. I want to make that clear to those doing it at home. The next thing that I'm going to look for is going to be the complexity of the whiskey. Notice these are all similar. These are all kind of a Venn diagram. They all kind of overlap, but they're all different. And so they might overlap a little bit, but complexity is different. It's not the amount of a flavor that you're getting. It's not how much flavor you're getting compared to the alcohol. It's how complex that flavor is. You can have a ton of flavor and not a lot of alcohol, but it tastes like straight caramel. You're getting so much caramel or you're getting so much oak. You're not even getting a lot of harshness. You're just getting a ton of oakiness. You can have that, but that ha you can have that with very inexpensive whiskeys sometimes, and it's not the most complex flavor. You can also have the flip of that. You can have caramel, oak, spice, cinnamon, nutmeg, herbs. You can have all that in one glass, but the way it's delivered is overwhelming, and most people won't even pull those notes out of it because they're just like, I don't know what I'm tasting. I know I'm tasting a lot. And it's kind of like the smell of a good candle versus the smell of a bad candle. Some candles have a ton of smell to them, but it's not working. And it might even be things that you like. They just don't work. That happens with whiskey sometimes. 
That was a really good metaphor I just came up with. <laughs> but there can be all these flavors, but if they're all delivered at once and they're all overwhelming your palate and they're all not mixing properly, then that's not good complexity either. So good complexity is going to be a good amount of flavor, a different types of flavors, and those flavors working together in a symphony is the way I like to put it. If you have a bunch of people in a room and they're all playing instruments and they're all playing something different, it's going to sound like garbage. But if they're all playing the same symphony, the same, uh, if it's an orchestra, whatever, if it's orchestrated properly, I don't know music terms anymore. I played the trumpet for six months. If it's orchestrated properly, it's going to sound fantastic. That's what is happening where you can have a lot of flavor and not a good complexity. So good complexity, you're going to have different flavors. They're going to be delivered differently, and they're going to work together in order to create that sort of symphony. Symphony. Now, one of the reasons that I thought this was Wild Turkey 101, and I could still totally be wrong, uh, was because of that symphony, because Wild Turkey 101 does that very well. It has a nice flavor to it, uh, and it, has, it, it delivers it with a nice complexity, especially for the price. I can't remember if Bullet Bourbon was one of the ones that she had to pick from. I will tell you all the ones she had to pick from at the end, but I can't look right now because if I look, then I'll know which one's missing, so I'm not. But that's one of the reasons I thought maybe it was a Wild Turkey. So this has a nice complexity. This this brings it up into the higher dollar range for, for me. The other ones are still keeping it down low, but this would bring it up into the higher dollar range for me. Now... I mentioned quality of flavor versus harshness, and this isn't even a bullet point, but I want to take a moment to mention harsh flavors, because I didn't put it as a bullet point, but I think I should have. Sometimes there's just a bitterness, a harshness. There's no better way to describe it than harshness, and, and that's, it can taste like different things. It can taste like very, very charred wood, like if you burn your hot dog on the grill, although I actually like my hot dogs kind of overcooked, but you get what I mean, overly charred. Uh, it can taste like, I've mentioned, envelope taste. Sometimes it's a good envelope. Like I feel like Green Spot has that a little bit, but it's because of the finishing process, and it actually works in the context. But sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it's just like that straight bitterness. Um, so sometimes the harshness presents itself in that way. Sometimes it presents itself, you'll hear me say, alcohol harshness. It tastes like alcohol. It's not necessarily burning me, but it tastes as though there's alcohol in it, as if you were to take vodka and just water it down and taste that. That's kind of the taste that it has. So that presents itself in different ways, and harshness can be a huge, huge, huge indicator of the, the price of a whiskey. The problem is, sometimes it's not. That, that's one problem. The other thing is, it's so easy to confuse with a note that you subjectively don't like. And I've done this all the time. It's so easy to, if I don't like that uh, Swiss cheese, that licking an envelope note that Green Spot has, it's so easy to say that's harsh when it's not. It's actually a note that other people like. They put it there on purpose. They want it to taste like that. So that's one of the reasons that that one can be a little bit dangerous. Although this one that I was drinking, I didn't get a lot of harshness from it. I am going to give it one more sip, and then we're going to talk about one last aspect of it and then we'll get into kind of the market stuff that can also drive up price that I don't think should drive up price. So what I'm trying to look for is, is it an objectively harsh note? So it's not just a note that I don't like. It's not just a little bit too oaky because people like oaky. It's burnt harsh wood that most people would not like. That's what I'm looking for. Um, and in this case, I mentioned burnt harsh wood, and I didn't mention envelope taste, because this has a little bit of that burnt harsh wood. Just a little bit. It's not too much. Um, and and there's, a lot of, there's a good amount of oakiness to this. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about this, this little bit of a harshness like ashy. Ashy is a good word for it. Uh, I see a little bit of it, which leads me to believe, hopefully, I was on the right track with this. I, I might raise the price up to $30. I've been saying less than $30. Maybe it's around $30. One, one more sip. I hope I'm right. My palate's been off a little bit lately. I'm going to start making excuses right now because I'm nervous. Genuinely, my palate's been off a little bit lately, but that's just an excuse because I'm nervous. Anyhow, let's move on. The last thing I want to talk about is I didn't mention anywhere in here the type of flavor. And I even made a 
point to distinct that, to make a distinction between that and harshness. The type of flavor I try not to pay attention to when I'm doing these tastings because there are some flavors that I just don't like and other people do. And so I always try to make that distinction that it doesn't matter what the type of flavor is. And I like to mention the type of flavor in my reviews so people know what to expect, but that doesn't make it more or less expensive. For everybody who thinks Oki is bad, there's somebody who can't get enough of it. For everybody who thinks Amberana is overdone and it's way too strong, there's somebody who there's not a strong enough Amberana finish on the market for them. That's always the case. So I try to separate myself from the types of flavors, which is a really hard thing to do, and I mess it up all the time. There's also uh, one other thing. Age obviously makes it more expensive. And if you do just do enough reps, if you, if you drink enough different whiskeys, you'll start to recognize what the younger ones taste like and what the older ones taste like. So there, there are people who out there who say that tastes young. And you might say, well, what do you mean it tastes young? It's kind of like something you just get used to. When you get used to trying different whiskeys, you, you recognize this old one tastes like this and this old one tastes like that. And this young one tastes like this and this young one tastes like that. You'll start to just notice the trend, I guess. Kind of like I've mentioned before, I don't eat pears, but I know what pear tastes like from getting pear notes in whiskey and reading that it's a pear note and my friend's saying it's a pear note and I was finally like, oh, that's what pear tastes like in a whiskey at least. Um, so that's kind of kind of the same idea. Now let's move on to other things that drive up price. And I'm going to just kind of casually taste while I talk about these things, but I won't spend as much time on them because I think I've talked a lot about them, but I think it's a, an important thing to keep in mind. Your packaging can drive up your price. So something as simple as adding wax to your bottle, that costs money. Something as complex as putting your bottle in a wooden box, that's expensive. Even if it's just a dollar, those dollars add up. And if you're making a certain percentage of profit, so if you're saying, I want to make, I'm just making this number up, 10% profit on every bottle, and you add $1 to it, you're actually adding a dollar and 10 cents because you're adding a dollar to the price but you need to make 10% profit. So now you're adding the 10 cents on top of that. That math, you know, it, it, there's more complex math than that. I used round numbers to make it easy. But that's my point, is that you are driving up the price and all those nickels and dimes add up. So certain things you're paying for that aren't even contributing to the experience of the whiskey. Uh, the packaging's a big one of them. Aging's another thing that you pay for, whether you like it or not. Age sometimes makes it taste better, sometimes it doesn't. Aging a whiskey longer can add character, it can add complexity. Sometimes it makes it taste worse, sometimes it gets too tannic. But nevertheless, it usually makes it more expensive because they're having to sit on that inventory longer. They're losing more of it every year to what's called the angel's share. More of it is evaporating every year, if that's the angel's share. And it just gets more expensive the older that it gets. So that could just add price, and it could not make it better. So that's one of those things to look out for. Sometimes it does make it better, and I'm not saying it doesn't, uh, but sometimes it doesn't make it better. Another thing uh, that can make it more expensive is when it's blended, what it's blended with, especially sourcing, which I have as a separate bullet point. But depending on what it's blended with, it can be more expensive. And it costs money to put it in blending vats and blend it all up. So the different, if you're adding uh, a bunch of different things together and you're adding just time and logistics and different distilleries to it, that can drive up the price a little bit as well. And with that, like I mentioned, sourcing, you're having to buy it off of somebody else who made it and then you're blending it and then you're reselling it, if you're blending it. Sometimes you're just buying it and reselling it. In any case, you're sourcing it off of somebody else. That can make it more expensive. I want to say can because it doesn't always have to. Because sometimes sourcing, actually most of the time, if you're just starting a distillery, sourcing is actually cheaper than starting from scratch because if you start with your own distilling, you have to sit on it for a few years. So it's not always more expensive, but it can add cost to it. Uh, and I'm not saying anything negative about sourcing. You guys probably know my opinion of that. If you've been around, you know that there are plenty of sourced whiskeys that I really like. Finishing, another thing that I like, but it adds cost. You're putting it in new barrels. You're having to buy more barrels. You're having to let it sit longer. You're having to buy barrels that had specific things in them or are made out of specific woods or exotic woods. Exotic woods are a cost driver. All those different types of finishing, aging, maturing, those will all drive up the cost as well. And then the last two that I'll, I'll put together, 
marketing and social media. Some just have really good marketing. That marketing might even just be that you can't find it on shelves, and sometimes that's very clever marketing. And social media. People such as myself contribute to this. And I have something that I want to mention about that, but l- let me get through this part, I guess. People such as myself are doing reviews of these whiskeys. We're talking about how much we like them. As I mentioned, the economy, the demand is kind of driving the price sometimes. And so if I were to post right now that this is the best whiskey that I've ever had and other people were to see that and they were to start posting it as well, then it would gain popularity and sometimes gain price. And we've seen things become allocated for that reason. Uh, some things that become allocated become allocated for that reason, to clarify. Uh, sometimes it's just good marketing. They've just got really good marketing. They make their bottle look nice. They make it in higher demand. Marketing teams doing what marketing teams do best. Not only does that add cost because it's expensive to market things, but also that will drive up the price because it will increase the demand. Now, what I want to mention about social media side of things, because I do a lot of reviews, this is underrated. You haven't heard of this, but it's good. Uh, This is a budget, but but it's really good. Uh, And people always get upset with me and say, hey, don't tell people. And some people are joking, like, don't tell them. They're going to, you know, it's going to become allocated. And some people are serious. Like, I've had people angry at me for telling people that Wild Turkey 101 is a really great budget bourbon. Uh, And the reason I bring that up is, that might happen sometimes. And I think it has legitimately happened in the past. But it's not always going to happen. And there will always be good replacements for it on the market. Uh, that's the upside to this bubble that we're seeing in American whiskey. I used air quotes for those listening to the audio version. Uh, that's the upside to this bubble that we're seeing is that it's just uh, we're getting a lot of supply with the demand. And so because of that, there's almost always a good replacement. If Wild Turkey 101 goes by the wayside, becomes allocated, uh, it tastes different, but Evan Williams Bottled and Bond's a great budget bourbon. There's always other budget bourbons out there that still taste really good. Now, uh, I'm always trying to change up my recommendations because of this, and I'm always trying to throw new things out there because of this, and you might see that. Uh, But if the same bottle is staying cheap, you might see me recommend it multiple times for that reason, because I want everybody to know about it. I want everybody to be able to get their hands on it. Then if it becomes expensive, there will be a new one, trust me, and I'll be recommending it. And the last thing that I'll mention, to those who are thinking about joining that Patreon page, I do have a a chat on there now, so we can talk about these sorts of things in the chat, similar to a Discord. It's an internal Patreon feature now, though. Uh, And I also have a quick review guide. I believe it's for the $10 tier and up, but you can correct me if I'm wrong. Just just go look in those benefits. Um, And I call it the Whiskey Noobs Quick Review Guide. And I put every whiskey that we've had on the show, I put a few quick notes about it, and then I put how much I think it is worth at the time of putting it on the review guide because things continually get expensive. But in general, it's very close because the prices don't move too, too much, especially not over the course of just a couple years. So I'm constantly adding to that, and I think that will help with this a little bit. If you're interested in that, if that was, you know, if that's something that interests you in the Patreon, I just wanted to mention it. And if not, I recommend you make your own. Make it in Excel or in Microsoft Word or whatever, and uh, it's a nice way to keep track of different things at different prices, especially as prices continue to rise. You can look back and be like, wow, I had that much money for that bottle, and now it costs how much? Something just to keep in mind. I'm going to do one last tasting, and then I'm going to embarrass myself trying to guess how much this is worth. It definitely smells young. It's got like a light caramel to it, a light sugar, maybe a touch of citrus on the nose. I think I mentioned that earlier. Definitely a little bit of uh, season, not seasonings, spices. I'm hoping I'm not talking myself into making this more expensive. It might be. I could be very wrong. We'll see. It's got a really nice finish. Right after you swallow, it's really nice. I could be wrong. This could be a more expensive one. See, this is where I resort to my gut feel because now I'm going to talk myself into making it more expensive, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to say $30. I hope I don't regret it. I'm going to say $30. If I'm right or I'm wrong, it is what it is. Let's do the big reveal, and then I'll tell you all the options that I had to pick from. Big reveal, $30. Rabbit hole. Ooh, Cave Hill. Okay. Okay. All right. I was way off. Uh, Here's what I'll say about that. I love some of Rabbit Hole's offerings. 
Um, I actually hadn't had anything except for Cave Hill until Kentucky Bourbon Festival. And the reason that I haven't is because I don't like Cave Hill very much. To me personally, and maybe this could be very well me confusing flavor with uh, the subject or the objective things. I could be confusing the subjective with the objective when I'm tasting this whiskey. But Cave Hill, I should probably leave it uncovered so you guys can see it. Cave Hill to me, and I've always thought this, it just doesn't bring enough body. It doesn't bring enough flavor to me. And I can see the complexity in it. I mean, I really can. And like I said, it, it finishes super nicely. But when I'm on the palate, I have to search out those flavors a little bit. So, yeah, I was definitely off on this. But this is the farthest off that I've been. That's going to make people think I'm cheating on TikTok. But I'm not. But I can see why you'd think that now. Um, but, yeah, I, uh, I've i never been a huge fan of Cave Hill. Um, if you are, that's totally fine. For me personally, it just doesn't bring the flavor. But I wanted to mention that I like Rabbit Hole because I tried it at KBF then because I, I didn't buy bottles of it because it's expensive and, and I wasn't a fan of Cave Hill. Um, and so I tried them at KBF where it was free and I loved Derringer. I loved the barrel pick that they had at KBF. So I think it's just Cave Hill and maybe it's just this bottle. I mean, this is the only bottle of Cave Hill that I've had because I didn't like it very much. So I don't drink it very much. Um, maybe it's just this bottle. Or maybe it's just this label. It's just Cave Hill. But not a huge fan. Other things that, that Rabbit Hole has, very good. Uh, and I will continue. I just had Rabbit Hole Rye at a bar the other day. Loved it. They have great selections. I was not a fan of Cave Hill. Um, but let me know if you are. Let me know if you specifically really like Cave Hill. Because I'm curious. Because I personally just don't like it very much. But it could just be my palate. So as I'm sitting here telling you about how you have to be objective and not subjective, maybe I made that same mistake. And that's okay, because we make mistakes. I try to be clear about that throughout the whole episode, but I'm not going to sit here and ramble and cover up my mistakes anymore. I hope you guys learned from this episode, and I hope you can use this in your own blind tastings. Would I have loved for this to be Wild Turkey 101? Absolutely. It's not, though. And I'm going to, you know what? You know what? We're going to get some Wild Turkey 101 and put it next to it and compare a little bit. As I mentioned, about every minute of every day in every video, side-by-side -side tastings are a great way to learn. So let's try it. Okay, so to me, the wild turkey makes it more obvious that the cave hill doesn't have so much harshness. But the wild turkey, for me, for my taste buds, might even have more flavor. It's definitely got more harsh harshness, though. So I can see why this is more expensive than wild turkey. Um... Uh, it's just not for me, though. And that, that's all I'm going to say about that. I wanted to do a quick side-by-side, -side, though, because I think that's a little bit fun. Wild Turkey's definitely more harsh. It's a great whiskey for the price, though. All right. That's all I have to say about that. This is a great example of drinking in order to learn about whiskey. And I'm doing that side-by-side -side a little bit here. I'm going to continue this after this episode is over. But that's all that I've got for this episode, guys. I really hope this helped. Let me know if you guys like Cave Hill or if you use these techniques or what you thought about this episode. I'm trying to get back to that educational content. Refocus things a little bit as you guys have requested. I appreciate your feedback. I appreciate your reviews. I appreciate your patronage. Thank you so much for listening. I will leave you guys with learn to drink, drink to learn. Thank you guys for listening to another episode of Whiskey Noobs. If you need more Whiskey Noobs content in your life, make sure you check out our Patreon page in the show notes. And if you like the show, please make sure to leave a five-star rating or review. It only takes a couple of minutes, and they're way more helpful than people realize. If you want to do tastings alongside the show, make sure you join the email list by sending an email to whiskeynoobspodcast at gmail.com with a subject line that says email list. You'll receive monthly emails with a list of the whiskeys that will be featured throughout the month so that you can buy them ahead of time. You can also find more Whiskey Noobs content on Instagram at Whiskey underscore Noobs and on TikTok at Whiskey Noobs Podcast. Once again, thank you guys for listening. The Whiskey Noobs Podcast does not support underage or otherwise irresponsible consumption of alcohol.